you obviously look across the venture capital space, not just in crypto. So give us your view of how you think about the world and, and how crypto fits into that. Oh, we're, we're all so screwed. Like, just, it's so bad. But, you know, I think that, that a terrible macro environment is good for really early stage VC, um, because if you're sitting inside of, you know, a big tech company or a big, you know, publicly traded crypto exchange, and you watch your, you know, RSUs melt down to nothing, all of a sudden the opportunity cost to leave and go build that thing you've been thinking of building for so long becomes functionally nothing. And so, you know, from, from a founder and investor standpoint at the earliest stages, I think that the next couple of years are gonna be exciting. If you're in your 50s and you wanted to retire based on your public market portfolio, I am sorry, and you're never gonna be able to do that now, like we are screwed in the macro. Um, but I think early stage is good and I think that that, you know, Crypto, in theory, is a hedge that's not tied to public markets. Crypto, in practice, has become very much tied to public markets when they go up. But I do think that when public markets go down, it's an interesting opportunity to look at crypto. You know, crypto deals are not going to be nearly as overheated as they have been the last couple of years. And so for, as an investor, it's sort of a good time for me. And unfortunately, if it's a good time for me, it's probably a bad time for everybody else. It's, it's an interesting perspective, and, and we're going to touch more on um, crypto relative to the broader markets and, and if we can decouple there. But Matthew, I want to stay on this, on this topic, the general state of the market, as you see, you've been active in the space for a while, and particularly in, in regions and areas of the world that some of us may not be as familiar with. Sure. So look, I mean, we always, there was always this narrative that uh, Bitcoin and crypto overall was somehow an uncorrelated asset and uh, or an inflation hedge, things like that. It was always quite suspect in, in my view, but now we know that to be empirically fa uh, false. It's a risk on asset. And it, the correlation will continue to increase over time as it becomes a more and more important asset class, increasingly integrated with the broader economy. So. Early days, it was mostly correlated to endogenous factors, correlated to things going on in crypto itself. Now it's correlated to stocks and all kinds of things, right? So we know that to be true. Um, so it's gonna be a difficult environment for a while, uh, given macro, broader macro, if you were just in the price goes up or whatever, right? But if you look underneath the hood, my, I have a personal bias that I, I love bear markets for building, but I'll try to put that aside. And if you look underneath the hood, I think you see a lot of really positive things. We could take gaming as an example. In the initial stages of Web3 gaming, it was pretty much uh, crypto-centric visions and then token economics and, and, and all that. And then at the very end, okay, you, you, we gotta somehow put a game on this. It was, it was the wrong direction, fundamentally. Whereas now we're seeing um, world-class game developers that are starting with a gaming-centric vision and then thinking about how crypto assets, whether it be tokens or NFTs, et cetera, how can they support their gaming vision and make it more powerful, which is a much more sophisticated vision and something that could be sustainable, could have legs. So I think if you look underneath the hood, Gaming being just one example, you're seeing a lot of really positive signs uh, in this broader, challenging macro environment. I view it kind of like that. And David, similar to Sarah, you look at areas outside of just crypto. So um, you're an active investor in the space. Yes. How does that fit into your worldview right now? Okay, so first let's look at a little bit of history. Blumberg Capital has been around for three decades, so we've seen many crashes and booms and so on, and it's very cyclical. We try and say that venture capital, the sport, well, start off, say investment bankers, no offense to anyone here, and hedge fund folks that are in the public markets, maybe crypto, the sport is surfing. It's waves and wind and, and, and you know, surface phenomena. Blumberg Capital and Sarah and, and folks that are in the venture capital, our sport is scuba diving long-term currents, don't hit the reef, watch out for big sharks, that, that kind of thing. So we're much slower, lower paced. We're not as affected by the surface trends. We don't really care. I mean, it's great when the market's up, but we keep investing when the market's down. Our best investments, probably some of yours have been made in downturns. 2001, 2003 was a great time to invest. 2008, 9, 10 was a fantastic. We had 80x returns in some of our companies in that period. So wonderful time. And if you're an entrepreneur, it's a great time to find talent. So for you entrepreneurs, 
this is the time to find people that are otherwise uh, busy, the big companies and rising uh, RSUs, as Sarah mentioned. So a couple other points. Um, every transition of technology starts with the first instantiation using the old paradigm. So for example, the first television used as, a, as their scene, a person standing at a microphone like they had done for radio era. And so we're, I like your point, Matt, that we need to find some new native, you know, um, token-related, crypto-related, blockchain-related kinds of gaming mechanics and things that'll be probably different from what we've seen in the past. So I'm saying that the old platforms can be adapted and, and improved, but we should take advantage of the new abilities of the new platforms. So that's, again, a very exciting place. We are in such early uh, innings right now that this is you know, a couple um, volatility periods, but don't worry about it. Stay on course. A lot of technical development is going on right now that will help the security, the compliance, the regulatory stuff needs to be fixed. But there's so much out ahead of us. Uh, I would just say, we'll be fine. Keep your hat on. And for those of us who are investors, it's better to buy when it's a down market. That's my summary. Uh, thank you for that, David. And so it sounds like you're, you're more of a scuba diver than a surfer, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Joe, I want to go back, I want to go back to you. You invest across liquid and illiquid um, tokens and equity. Um, and I think one of the challenges investors face is deciding how to get exposure to crypto. They may say, okay, I get it. Uh, crypto is here to stay. How do I play it? On, on the liquid side, it's liquid, which is a benefit, but tokens are volatile uh, and it's very difficult to, pr to apply a traditional valuation framework on the equity side, there's, there's not really a robust public equity market yet, and so you have to go illiquid and play it in the private market. So you invest across the board. How do you think about that, and where's the most interesting opportunities today? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question I get from um, our LPs and prospective LPs all the time. <clears throat> so the thing about uh, investing in crypto is that if you just choose venture, then uh, you now have to manage a liquid portfolio, whereas you typically never had to do that before with traditional venture. So for example, for the past, call it 80 years of venture capital, uh, they typically would invest in early stage businesses, they'd get some private equity, and within, call it maybe five to 15 years, they'd get some sort of exit. Or worst case, maybe the, the, the company goes bankrupt, et cetera, right? Um, with crypto, you don't wait five to 15 years to become liquid, you wait months. And so what that has forced, I think, a lot of traditional venture capitalists into is a discipline that they aren't necessarily designed for or have the experience in, which is managing a liquid portfolio. Crypto has this function by design, and it's not a bug, it's a feature of crypto. The reason is, is that if you are bringing people into your network or protocol via a token, you now have a network participation and folks to be in, involved and engaged with your network and protocol. But that means that token trades in a liquid market. So we work with a lot of founders to help them identify, look, on the one hand, tell us about you know, the project or protocol that you're, that you're focusing on and how the liquid nature of your network affects your users and how that actually affects like, the outcome of the actual business. But furthermore, let us introduce you to market makers. Let us introduce you to understanding how market structure actually works, whereas a lot of times founders have never had to think through this type of stuff. On the flip side, in the liquid space, you know, maybe we didn't get early enough into some private token deal where the token is now uh, tra trading publicly and it's down 95% from its all-time high. Well, we may have a fundamental view on, say, decentralized storage, just as an example, that we think this is gonna be a, a pillar of Web3 application development going forward. Well, if we see a token that we see as the category winner for decentralized storage, and it's down 95% from its high, we're probably going to take a position, a long position in that. Now, the difference is, we wouldn't just go and buy the spot token. Why? Because one, you have tax implications, and two, you actually may move the market depending on size. I think a lot of the, the capacity constraints of liquid strategies, when allocators and investors are looking at liquid and crypto go, there's $35 million worth of you know, capacity for this market neutral strategy, or there's maybe 100 to $200 million of a you know, momentum-based or directional strategy. That's the same thing for just allocating to spot tokens. So what you need to do, you need to have folks that understand how to manage the sophistication, the sophisticated liquid portfolio through things like uh, NDFs, options, et cetera, where these are now getting set up. Whereas in the previous cycle, uh, the bear bull market ending in 2017, 
These didn't exist. Now we actually have this available to us. So you can actually have, say, a view on a particular asset that may be down 80, 90, 95% from its all-time high, and you don't just have to go in and you know, punch the order book and move the market. You can actually use more of these sophisticated uh, instruments that existed in Wall Street for a long time. Those now actually exist for crypto. So one of the things that we try to do is find a balance between the two. How do we get the asymmetric upside from, say, the private token deals, coupled with being able to express our view on the liquid side and manage that entire book across the board? This is something that's fundamentally new to managing money in crypto versus basically any other asset class that we've seen, which is another reason why we think you kind of need to have a little bit of both understanding of private markets and also the liquid markets to capture the most value out of it. David, I think you wanted to jump Yeah, in. I, to, I think your, your points are all good, however, <laughs> your grandfather's venture capital firm is not today's venture capital firm. And there's a very nice thing that's happened in the markets. Um, I always think, I always blame everything on government. When government overregulates, the market finds a way around it. And so when Sarbanes-Oxley and some of the other um, laws came in that caused the, uh, the um, IPO prices to really rise and p held people back from IPOs, so people started doing a lot more secondary trading in, in, in shares and so on. And that's really active now. Just, just before this meeting, this uh, panel, I was with the, you know, a, a group deciding on how to execute a secondary transaction. Um, and we have both bought and sold. Now, one thing, a little free advice here. Watch out for your QSBS uh, tax issue there. It can mess it up because <laughs> QSBS is the best tax um, uh, um, savings plan for early stage investors around that I know of. And, when it goes into secondary, it can mess it up. So just check with your tax advisors. But all I'm saying is, yes, I agree with you that the you know minute by minute trading of crypto is wonderful flexibility. It does take years to build a, a, a startup company, you know, to, to size in general, and and so we can't really get around that. But there are some nice options now with secondaries that help bridge that gap. And I think some of this does come down to the structure of your fund, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's liquid or illiquid or or a hybrid. Um, well, I think most, I think to speak, I think Sarah might, most funds now, we can do tokens or equity. We do both. Most people do, I think. So, Sarah, I want to I wanna go to you on this question. I, I think you, you might be in between them. You're sitting in between them physically. Mm -hmm. But give us your view on equity versus tokens. I know you can at least do both. Yeah, I don't love to just have tokens. Um, I think in the ICO madness, you saw a lot of people, a lot of investors who invested in just equity and they didn't have any token exposure and the token holders made a bunch of money and the equity holders are like, is this thing ever gonna launch? And it's like, oh no, sweetie, <laughs> it was an ICO. So, you know, you don't want just the token exposure or just the equity exposure. Just token exposure makes me nervous because at the end of the day, God did not make me to be a hedge fund trader. I am a VC. And so, you know, just sort of buying and selling minute by minute is not my strong suit. Um, and so I tend to want both if both is available. And the way that I think about it in, in VC, and I think a lot of investors are like this, is I just want my interest to be al aligned with the founders and vice versa. So if you can go become a billionaire on tokens and leave me, you know, hold, holding the bag on, on equity, that's a heck of a moral hazard, right? And vice versa. So if I have what you have and you have what I have and you want to make money, then I'm probably going to make money. And that sounds like a really dumb shell game way to, to invest. But I am, again, a early stage investor. So we don't look at numbers and charts. We're like, hmm, if you become a billionaire, then I'll make some money and my investors will keep giving me money and eventually I'll be a billionaire too. And we all want yachts. So like, I need our yacht strategy to be aligned. I'll, I'll take that. Uh, Matthew, to you on this question. You're, so you're a lot active. to unpack here uh, with the, some of the previous comments. I, I would strongly suggest that it's probably not in the, in the business of, uh, it's not the business of a VC to be doing minute by minute trading of their liquid portfolio. Uh, but I'm not sure that was what anyone was necessarily suggesting, but I just wanted to make that point first. Uh, with that said, I think there are huge advantages to being able to take uh, uh, to, to huge advantages to being able to take advantage of the fact that uh, investments in crypto become liquid faster than we're used to in trad fund. Uh, as an example for us, we built much of our early position in Solana in the secondary markets. Um, I think the additional thing that I would add, I would add two additional things. I would say um, with respect to token versus equity, equity with a token kicker, et cetera, et cetera, 
Um, I think it's very much dependent on the deal itself. Uh, what type of deal it is? Is the infrastructure? Is it? A, is it? Uh, is it um, an L1? What type of deal is it? And how is the value going to accrue with the deal structure? And then the most important thing to me is that as a VC, you need to be able to have the flexible mandate to be able to do all the different types of deals and find the uh, uh, the one that is most, find the structures that are most relevant to a specific situation. You need to have a broad mandate. Liquid, SAFs, et cetera, et cetera. You need to be able to do them all, especially important in crypto. And then the other thing that I would add, which is really important, I think, is that um, the fact that, we've already discussed how the fact that tokens are liquid early really changes a lot of aspects of the VC game. I think it's important to mention that there are very complicated incentive problems that come along with that. So this is a feature, not a bug, but it requires very careful thought. You have responsibilities across many different stakeholders in both the short and the long term. So you have to think about things like, um, okay, for this specific deal, it might be in the best interests of our LPs to have earlier liquidity of a fiduciary responsibility. However, is that best interest short term, long term, or both? It may be that taking advantage of liquidity is in the short-term best interests of your LPs, but not their best long-term interests because that is going to affect your reputation, that is going to affect your long-term deal flow. So you have a really complicated patchwork of incentive problems and stakeholder responsibilities that you have to solve that is created by something that is fundament fundamentally a feature, the fact that you have access to liquidity in a much faster fashion than TradFi. So I just wanted to mention that. So I want to take it back to the current market environment. Let's talk valuations. Um, we passed on a lot of deals in Q4 and Q1 on great companies just because valuations got completely out of whack. Um, David, I'll, I'll start with you. You mentioned you've been investing for three decades now. Um, how do you think about valuations? Have they become more reasonable? Are they attractive right now? Well, I think you know, the whole world got drunk and again, on government, the modern monetary uh, policy uh, for a decade, and um, we were living at the tail end of it. So we were in a fluffy period of very unrealistic um, stuff combined with a period of exceptional technological innovation. So we, we have both. We have government, I think, screwing up most of the time all over the world, and that's not a partisan comment, just everywhere. <laughs> and we have entrepreneurs doing great things all the time. And so um, we continue to invest in great entrepreneurs. When it's more expensive, we probably invest a little bit less. When it's less expensive, we invest more. Um, again, we're trying to be <laughs> scuba divers and avoid the, the surface chop. Um, what, what can I say? We have had companies in our portfolio, as I think somebody said, you know, need longer runway. And we've emphasized for all of our companies, you know, sort of toward the end of the last year, um, hey, this, you know, good times are ending get you know, financing in place, make sure your, your burn is manageable. And so people are going up to two years of runway. In traditional, it was like 12 to 18 months. Now it's definitely two years. That's a good thing, I think, for most of our companies. And the other thing that I'm noticing is that the weaker companies are having a lot of time raising, and the good companies are being fought after. So it's a flight to quality, I guess. Certainly seeing a flight to quality, as I mentioned at the beginning, I, by my count, there's been about 50 rounds that have closed this year involving crypto unicorns. So you're still seeing big up rounds with, um, with, with quality teams that have traction. Yep. You're definitely seeing consolidation around quality. Um, Matthew, your view on, on valuation um, on, the, uh, on, on the equity side with, with, uh, with founders that you're talking to? I think it very much is dependent on deal stage and geographies as well. Um, so we know it to be true that there have been a lot of mega funds being raised in this industry. They have tremendous pressure to deploy capital realistically, true. right? And I think that um, it's uh, definitely still affecting valuations of larger companies, but uh, not necessarily at seed. Additionally, I think um, we're seeing San Francisco and Miami valuations still sky high. But if you look at Bengaluru, it might be much more reasonable. So I think it, there's a, a huge difference in geographies as well. Uh, even if you adjust for any other factors, if you adjust for 
uh, size of the vision, their ability to go international, adjust for all the factors, and I, I still think you'll find much more reasonable valuations as you start to get away from the epicenters of capital, realistically, right? Capital deployment. So Sarah, as, as Matthew mentioned, a lot of money has been raised, um, a lot of new investors coming into the space, and now a lot of them going earlier and earlier stage. You, you invest at the early stage. How are you seeing that affect valuations right now, if at all? So the earliest stage is hard with valuations because it's often first-time founders. Um, and so what first-time founders usually don't realize is when you read about uh, you know, a, a pre-seed round or a seed round in TechCrunch you know, today, that was probably raised eight to 10 months ago. And now those founders have like blown all their money and they are like getting pressed to try to go raise more money. And you know what they say the valuation was? Oh, we raised at you know a 50 million valuation. Well, technically we raised the two million on a series of like 20 different safes, starting at five million dollar cap, and then like the very last sucker to buy in, you know, three days before the world went to shit earlier this year, paid a 50 million cap. But you know we actually had to recap him too, and now nobody actually paid that 50. But we're going to put that in our TechCrunch article because it sounds better, right? And so what happens to these poor founders is they come to me and they tell me, we're going to raise two on 10. We have an idea. And I'm like, great, I want a pony, right? Like, I can't help you with that because that's not a reasonable valuation. And I can try to explain that to you, but you're just going to be like, you know, this person doesn't understand our value and I hate that investor and then, you know, whatever. And then I'm not going to give you money because we're not going to be able to like find that synergy. And what you often see right now in the earliest stages is for first time founders or founders who aren't, you know, ha who don't have some sort of amazing track record, who aren't spinning out of some fancy thing, they end up not being able to get their rounds raised. And I know because I see six months later, eight months later, that deal will get recirculated to me on the same terms. And so things aren't getting done because founders over the last few years have been able to sort of not necessarily set the terms, but like indicate broadly, I want to raise 2 million and kind of market standard, right? I don't want to sell more than 20% of the company, so that means I'm raising it X. And, and I think that you have to get really real about what the prices at which deals are actually getting done right now. If you haven't already made somebody a shit ton of money and like raising a million dollars and then returning that same million dollars to your investors in an aqua hire where your cousin buys your company is not what I mean. Like if you're not already kind of fuck you rich, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word, then it's really hard right now to go out and raise these big fancy rounds even compared to a year ago. And so I worry a lot about early stage founders because I think a lot of them just don't get any bites because their valuation's wrong, even though if it were more in line with the market, oh, I'm raising one on five or one on four or whatever, you know, I think that they could maybe get that done and then go start to build. Has that changed at all given the current market environment or you're still seeing a That's disconnect? the problem, right? These people are raising on 21 prices, mm. right? And I remember once my friend uh, Ben Lear at Lear Hippo Ventures was talking to a founder years ago and the founder's telling him, you know, the price he wants for his round and Ben looks at him and goes, that's a YC valuation. I'll give you an NYC valuation, <laughs> right? And so you have to understand like what market are you in and, and what time, who's the investor, you know, what are the comps and what's really happening? And I think early stage founders are very much at a disadvantage with that. So Joe, uh, we just discussed early stage, but I think across all stages, things have gotten out of whack and you may have a scenario where some of these companies are gonna to need to do down rounds or non-traditional financings. Speak to that a little bit, and, yeah. and you obviously come from an, an operator background as well, so if you can weave in the importance of not maximizing valuation all the time, <laughs> I think it would be an interesting perspective. Yeah, absolutely, I mean, I, I, I agree with all the sentiment from the other panelists thus far. I think one of the things that I'll, that I'll mention, though, as you just alluded to with the, the headlines, um, is I talk, I try to talk founders out of the big headline, the big ego boost, because when you see some company raises X millions of dollars at Y billion dollar valuation, you actually don't know the terms of that deal, right? There could be, you know, crazy liquidation preferences or warrants that the founder could have less than 1% equity ownership of a $10 billion business, for example. And this has happened over and over again, especially in, the Silic in Silicon Valley. Um, so we actually try to steer them away from the headline and the ego boost that they'll get from the TechCrunch article and more towards what's a, uh, a, a valuation that you can actually grow into. And what we've seen uh, from a lot of the companies that are, have nothing to do with tokens. So I, so I agree with Matt on this, like 
there's going to be the aspect of what are the private equity deals that are going to be valued, say, as traditional SaaS businesses, for example? Or what are the protocol deals that are going to be valued very differently because there's a token associated with it? So a number of the kind of Web3 infrastructure companies, and I won't name any names, were big, were big investors and supporters of Web3 infrastructure companies. Um, a lot of them raised at multiple billion dollar valuations last year, but had $80 million in revenue. And you say, well, that's a pretty good number, except 78 million of it was actually for uh, token rewards at Ethereum's price of $4,000 a token. Well, that's not a recurring business model. And when you dig into the additional two million, that's two million in ARR. So ask yourself this question, is a two million ARR business worth a billion to $3 billion? I think the answer is unequivocally no. And so what we've seen is loads of secondary offerings come down from people saying, look, you know, I bought into this high valuation, I'll take 30 cents on the dollar, I'll take 50 cents on the dollar. In addition to that, uh, the say Bitcoin mining space, we've seen a lot of folks where their lending books have basically blown up because they've, they've lent to a lot of Bitcoin miners saying, I just need these off of my books as well. We got way over our skis. These guys bought hardware at $50,000 Bitcoin. It's trading 20K. Help us out. These are everywhere through the system. And so what is exciting to me about this is that um, the previous uh, cycles in crypto, we basically never had distressed asset funds. Now we actually are starting to see these things surface in crypto, which I think actually kind of bolsters the case for it being a, a longer term, some more sustainable asset class. So. Let's talk your book a little bit. Um, touch on an area within crypto um, that you either have been actively investing in or that you're, you're looking at very closely in the next six to 12 months. David, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, yes. So I, I did mention at the beginning, we like enterprise software. So infrastructure and fintech makes a lot of sense. So Trulia was the first one that I mentioned, and they're global, and they're doing really well based up in Vancouver. But one little point that came out. Almost every company we see today is global. They're born global. They have people in different places. They don't necessarily have a headquarters. They're like selling to customers all over the world. So it's, now, it's very rare that we see a company that's just, we're just gonna be in you know, Colombia for Colombian market. It's, it's very, very um, international these days. So that's one. Um, another company that we've invested in recently, a Miami-based uh, company, Alex Taub, uh, founded a company called Upstream. And again, in the infrastructure realm, it takes all the mess and stress out of creating a DAO, decentralized, the <laughs> autonomous organization, with the compliance, the consensus, the voting, the treasury, all that stuff. It's like Dow in a box. And so we like those kinds of things that are going to be good in good times and in bad times. They take away the stress. It's a, essentially an efficiency play, a productivity play. And, and we like that because they're consistent. And there'll be some you know, upsides with some of the high flyers that find a you know, particular game maybe that's really going to be the hit. We're not great at picking the, the, which game is going to be the hit, but we'd like to do payments or compliance or infrastructure for all the winners. So it sounds like opportunities that should be less correlated to the price of Bitcoin on any given day and over the longer term more dependent on just the growth of the ecosystem and the maturation. Indeed. Of the Again, we're super early, early stages. The, the, world, the tide is going to be rising. It has waves, so it'll be ups and downs, but stick with it. And, and one last thing, the average venture relationship with a founder, going to some of Sarah's points, lasts longer than the average American marriage, sad to say. But be careful who you get in bed with. Um, this is a long-term business. And yes, there are some nice new features that are you know, quick um, you know, liquidity and so on and so forth. But if you're going to have a board of directors and be involved with people and help them build their business, you want to pick the right team. Um, we have you know, third, third generations where we founded one, we funded a team three times now. And uh, those relations are so fulfilling, both personally and, and uh, professionally. Matthew, you mentioned gaming before. What are some other areas that you're focused on right so, now? So first of all, I just wanted to say regarding if you can't raise money because you don't, don't already have fuck you money, I would encourage you to reach out to us because I don't care if you have fuck you money or can get a warm referral or not. And uh, that sounds like a great source of opportunity for me. We've invested in people from six continents speaking probably a dozen or two dozen languages. I don't give a fuck who you know. So I've invested in people that have DM'd me on Twitter, have led to very successful investments. So don't worry about if you know whomever's cousin or whatever so you can get a warm referral. That game is bullshit and I think it's dying and I'm glad it's dying. It's not necessary anymore. Shoot your shot. Secondly, regarding what we're especially excited about. I'm especially excited, as I alluded to earlier with my comments on gaming, 
with people that are using crypto as a way to augment existing businesses. So maybe you're a brand and you're thinking, well, how can NFT drive my engagement? Or uh, maybe you have a Web2 app and you're thinking about how can token incentives help me better uh, grow my community, things like that. I think that um, a big part of mass adoption will, with crypto will be using crypto's very powerful incentive structures and popularizing features such as NFT as a way to make things that we currently do uh, more effective. And so we're especially excited about visions that are consistent with that. I think that will be very powerful for driving mass adoption. I think we're, we're all hopeful that we're past this phase of speculation and financial yeah. engineering and headed towards real world use cases. I think uh, we heard that in, in comments this morning on, on a panel. Um, Sarah, you opened the floodgates for the bad language, so thank you. But, you're welcome. Excuse me. Sorry about my language. <laughs> let's, let's stay with you on, on areas that you're focused on right now within crypto. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited about getting normal people into crypto. Um, in 2012, I went to dinner with the Winklevoss twins. I used to work for them. And Barry Silbert stops by, the guy who started Second Market, and they're talking about Bitcoin. I'm like, I don't understand this. Math with money, like whatever. And, you know, to the ends of the earth, I'm like, if I had just paid for dinner that night and told them to put that money into Bitcoin for me, like I would own the Javits Center, right? And You'd so have fuck you money. I would have fuck you money. I'm working on it. But, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, but, but then again, I was in Vegas recently and the waitress at the day club, I had a Bitcoin investor hat on from Gemini, one of my portfolio companies. And she goes, I've been trying to get all the other waitresses to invest in Bitcoin. I've been investing in Bitcoin for years. And I'm like, honestly, great. You're making like $5,000 a day in cash tips. Go put that in Bitcoin and hold. And that's an interesting retirement plan. And so for me, you know, it's companies like Gemini that make it as easy to do that as it does to, you know, go buy something on Net-A-Porte. Like that's the kind of stuff that I get excited about. How do you help create economic inclusion for real people? And I think that crypto, that's always been a goal of crypto. And then it kind of turned into like, oh, look at all these rich hedge fund guys, right? So the things that we can do to really kind of make good on that promise are, are what I get excited about. And Joe, you just launched your fund this year. So give us a sense for some of the early investments that you've been making. Sure. So we, we tend to look at um, five major themes, even though we're not sort of dogmatic to only those five themes. First is kind of DeFi 2.0. Um, we've seen companies that want to bring, say, interest rate swap markets on chain, which is an enormous engineering task and I'm not sure if it'll work out, but stuff like that's super interesting. Uh, we like the NFT ecosystem, not NFTs directly, but the picks and shovels and the kind of supporting ecosystem around NFTs. Um, I mentioned Web3 infrastructure, huge fans of that. Um, everybody needs this, side of, every developer needs this type of infrastructure to build their applications. Um, in addition to that, we like metaverse uh, and kind of Web3 video games and new ways of doing things, not necessarily just play to earn. And then finally, uh, the, the kind of fintech slash payments piece. But the, the, the kind of super set to all of this, I think, is something we always try to keep our eye on. And it's happened in previous cycles. And uh, a friend of mine over at Multicoin Capital had mentioned this, that every new bull market in crypto is typically kicked off when there's a new way of distributing tokens to people. And that's something that we try to keep a pulse on, whether it's through individuals, so getting more people, you know, normies, et cetera, into crypto through some new novel way of distributing tokens. This could be through NFTs, this could be through the Starbucks news today with their loyalty programs, myriad other ways of actually doing it. But more importantly, I think as more and more uh, uh, protocols and, and platforms move to say proof of stake network, which we all know the Ethereum merge is coming this week, there's ways that the protocols within those networks can actually incentivize validators and miners on those networks to support their new protocol. So we actually co-led a deal recently with Multicoin Capital in a project called uh, Clockwork where they're actually enabling um, developers to utilize this validator network to run additional tasks and compute. This is very common stuff that's happened in Web 1 and Web 2 for decades. It's not possible in Web 3. Clockwork is enabling this, but they're incentivizing validators by paying them in the native token, in this case, Solana, as opposed to, oh, use our token and you know, that's how you'll make money from it. 
That's a new way of actually incentivizing token distribution and, and uh, token value, especially for the under, underlying L1. So we see huge opportunities when companies and protocols are actually focusing on incentivizing the current validator networks that actually exist. There's a ton of ups, upside potential there, and we're investing heavily in that. I will say, just thinking about Salt last year, which had some crypto content, even in just this past 12 months, much less talk about price of tokens, buying you know, Ethereum versus Solana, a lot more about actual real world applications. Um, I think it's, it speaks to the speed of the industry and hopefully we can continue on, on that path. Um, just about two minutes left. Joe, you mentioned the Ethereum merge is coming later this week. Um, just quickly, bullish, bearish on the merge. Is it gonna go smoothly? Any thoughts that you have? Yeah, so uh, I wrote this to our, our monthly uh, update to our LPs earlier this, this month. We're actually, uh, unfortunately, non-consensus. We are somewhat bearish on the price action, but we actually do believe uh, the, the merge will be hugely bullish for uh, Ethereum longer term, especially given the, um, the benefits that you get from a proof of stake network. I was just going to say, everyone I know is, is bullish, so it's good to know that there are some less enthusiastic people out there. Sarah, same, same question to you. You know, I, I agree. I think that, that the short-term price could be a little bit dicey, but I also think that, you know, we're not here today to trade crypto, but price tips are a good time to buy, and, and once there's a good time to buy, you tend to see the price go back up, excitement, you see it in the news more, which helps for more adoption, more innovation, and I, I think that's good. Matthew, you guys positioned ahead of the merge or uh, really just looking through it? Putting price action aside, I would say that I'm enormously bullish on what it signifies for the industry. And I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, this time has come for us. It's definitely a major technological upgrade, so hopefully it goes smoothly. <laughs> David will end up with we you. Come, we come at it from the enterprise software. This is an improvement. It's a technical improvement. It's more energy efficient. There, there's good things. The smartest brains that I know are in that Ethereum network world, building new things, level one, level two. So I'm, I'm excited about that part of it. And we don't really speculate on, on tokens per se. I mean, if they come along in a deal, fine, but we're not in and out of that market, so I won't comment there. Um, yeah. Perfect. Well, we've got 30 seconds left, so we'll finish up there. Thank you, panelists, for a great conversation. Hope you enjoyed it.